Do you sing it, Tomo? Oh, Tomo. Now it's our motto. Go, Potsawa, Pizza. Good morning. Thank you for, for being here. I look forward to sharing some words and insight on some projects that I'm working on. We come from traditions that value the music of language, its poetry, and its ability to cultivate creativity and memory. I'm going to start with just highlighting two of my mentors that influenced me and the work that I'm doing in my community, but also the work as a father. Herman Agoyo Kafere, who was former o governor at Okewinge, chairman of the All Indian Public Council. He testified in Congress with this quote, to us these petroglyphs are not the remnants of some long lost civilization that has been dead for many years. They're part of our living culture. What is stored in the petroglyphs is not read in any book or to be found in any library. We need to return to them to remind us of who we are and where we come from and to teach our sons and daughters of it. These words provide breath and spirit and the continued work of my current project with the nonprofit, the Mesa Prieto Petroglyph Project. As a nonprofit, our mission is focused on protection of cultural sites and to educate about this 50 square mile landscape in northern New Mexico. We refer to it as Cinquaya, a flat mountain above the Mesa. This ancestral landscape comprises of more than 100,000 petroglyphs that date back at least eight to 10,000 years. I recall as a kid in the early 90s, Herman taking us students up to hike in the area, maybe not fully appreciating what was there in our, in our backyard. As a leader of our summer clan, he often led our deer dancers from the hills on the east side village into the center every February. He would often say our lines are getting longer and younger every year. He was passionate about sharing his stories. He often conveyed mixed emotions about formal education. Quote, as a child, I was very fortunate to have a grandpa who during the winter months shared with me many fireside stories. I was being taught Indian history, but because Indian history was not written down and presented in school, I grew up thinking that we did not have a history. This is uh, Matt Maherman on, on the left, um, leading one of our, our winter, uh, what I mentioned, the deer dances at home. Herman went on to study formal history at the University of New Mexico, and he, along with scholars like Joe Sando, really pieced together oral stories, including rock art and archival documentation, to deepen our understanding of the events of the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, which is a published book um, that is still used today. And it's because of the work of, of, of Herman and Joe and others, that we really have a record of what actually happened from a Tewa perspective of such a monumental event in history. Without their revolt, we would not be here. Without Pope and all those who came before, we would not have our own Tewa languages. Despite the ongoing misrepresentation of being non-literate, often by Western history canons, indigenous peoples have always been skilled at documenting histories in life ways. We can point to so-called early archaic petroglyphs, which here's some examples here, that date back thousands of years that determine movement, migrations, patterns, and stories 
and stories within stories. This volcanic eruption that happened in northern New Mexico over 3.3 million years ago gave life to a lava fall flow that cooled and became basalt boulders, which is a perfect pecking and etching panel for our ancestors to leave their stories. We refer to these as oh, these rocks. The literature on the Southwest history often refers to this harsh and drought environment um, that Native peoples, you know, went through this kind of desolate area. It's often descriptive of this Sahara Desert in many ways, but, you know, as you can see, we live in a very lush, riparian environment, and that's always been our relationship, is to settle along regions that cultivate, communities that cultivate um, agricultural practices. So why wouldn't you etch your marks on these rocks and leave these stories for others to know about? Not only petroglyphs, but we find examples of grinding slicks, of grid gardens, of rock check dams, of mulch gardens. Again, all clear evidence of how people used and continue to use these landscapes. And there was a mention about COVID, how you know during COVID we you know, experience loss of language. So even more so to be engaged in outdoors and the surrounding landscapes. We also have a series of petroglyphs that determine solstice and equinox markers. This is one example of a equinox marker where the shadow of the top boulder is perfectly aligned with this flute player and there's a lot of detail that I'm not going into um, discuss here, but it, you know, essentially the, this marking of shadows and marking of the sun is a real skill set because people always watched the movements of the sun, always watched and marked shadows as a time when we knew when to plant, when to harvest, etc. The second person I'm going to talk about is my grandmother, Esther Martinez Nabisaya. She often introduced herself that she was born in 1912, the same year New Mexico became a state and the Titanic sunk. This metaphor of the birth of a new period in history, as well as sinking, parallels much of my grandmother's tumultuous life. She was sent to the Santa Fe Indian boarding school during a transitional time when many Pueblo men were, were, served, were serving in World War I and families often looked to boarding schools as a means to care for their children. Much like other schools, the Santa Fe Indian school fell in line with federal assimilation policies not speaking her language. And then she was schooled in this curriculum called domestic science. For whatever reason, Indian children needed to learn how to properly cook and properly dress. And I have a, a long record of recordings with my grandmother, and I'm glad I ran into Siri, my friend uh, Wesley, talking about archival documentation, which is something that we're really interested in archiving at home as far as elder stories. Um, and really capturing these experiences. So, you know, I'd love to engage more with you on, the, on, these, um, on these practices. But I have one quote that I, that I documented, um, that I, the one short story that my grandmother shared with me that I, I just think it's, you know, adds some insight to her personality and what school was like. She said, for breakfast, we would have oatmeal, water, and bread. The boys would sit on one side and the girls on the other side of the cafeteria. We had oatmeal every day. It was not bad. Noontime was when we get some meat, some potatoes, and gravy. But if there's oatmeal left over from breakfast, that goes into the gravy. And then supper time, 
we often got beans every day. Now the gravy from the breakfast is in the gravy for the beans, and all that is left over from the day gets mixed in with beans. We never got just beans. She later ended up working in the service sector at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Um, and as you know, some of the history in the 1940s recruited labor from the valley and the service sector to, to be house workers, to, to build um, construction, um, to really build this, you know, this site of you know, what became you know, a national laboratory in the, in the 40s. Um, and it wasn't until her 50s that my grandmother took seriously documenting and writing her language, which resonates with me because I, I just turned 50. And so I think about you know, her, her age um, as a 50-year-old single mother raising 10 kids, working in the service industry, and really thinking about writing and documenting Tewa, which was unheard of at that time and quite controversial because Tewa is often and still is an orally conveyed language. Of a, of a Tewa dictionary that was first published in the late 80s that has since been modeled in many other Tewa speaking communities and it's taken a life of its own and it's really exciting to see the, the work that's unfolding from that initial work. Um, so the question about you know, putting tools in our toolbox I think is something that we all are mindful of as we think about our own communities and our own families here. In 2006, former President Bush signed into law the Esther Martinez Native American Languages Program. And the three highlights of this grant program is to really ensure the survival of native languages. Another component is to establish immersion programs, but really to, to support communities in funding to, really, to determine their own ways of curriculum development. What does language look like? What does language preservation um, detail as far as how and what is taught? And so um, some of you might be uh, recipients of that grant. And uh, we also have received a, a portion of this funding throughout the years at Okewinge. So suffice it to say that my grandmother and Herman, and many others, and I'm just highlighting these individuals that have really shaped my work and thinking about cultural preservation from a landscape, from an outdoor perspective. So I serve as the executive director of a nonprofit, and I've been on the board for 10 years, and over the last two years, I formally stepped in as the uh, executive director, which is the first time our volunteer nonprofit had a full-time um, director overseeing. And so our mission really is uh, to help record and document some of these archaeological features, um, to protect the cultural legacy of this larger mesa, this Rio Grande corridor, and to focus on education and outreach to local communities and tribal communities. But we're not in isolation as a site. And so kind of taking a step back regarding where we're situated, and this is very specific to northern New Mexico, is that up on the top of Tsinkwaya, at the very edge of the corridor, you can see clear sight lines to our four mountain ranges. To the north, we have Tseshu Ping, which is known as Eagle Nose Mountain. And it's a literal description of the curvature of the beak of an eagle. And you can see that in the mountain there, right? To the west, we refer to as Tsikamupin. Some might understand it as, as the Hamas mountain range. 
and to the south, driving in, as you look out your, your hotel room this morning while you're drinking your coffee, different orientation. But looking south, in Tewa, we refer to this as Okoping. And you, you see this as a literal description of a resting turtle, the back and the head of the turtle. And we know this as our southernmost boundary. And this is, you know, obviously coming from an A Tewa perspective. You know, Karis, Zuni, Tiwa, all the other nations in this region have their own names for these particular mountains and landscapes. And to the east, we, we call Kose Ping, which is Stone, Stone Man Mountain, Old Man Mountain. Um, and up at the top, it's a, it's a little, again, another little description of these rocky places with the lake down on the bottom. And there are, are areas rich in archaeological features with, with grid gardens, with check dams, with pottery sherds and lithics, that our people use these places to gather medicine, to hunt. And so they're named. They're named all the time in song and ceremony and traditions. It's not a big surprise that indigenous peoples document what was important and as a way to reflect our other relatives, birds, eagles, One of the most predominant images at Sinkwaya is our Avanyu. And there's distinction between Avanyu Sedo, Avanyu Kuyo. blessing the land. So lunder, uh, thunder, lightning, rain, all of those follow and this formation of how we understand the avenue. And we can see that in pottery and weavings and jewelry, that it's still as a source of a blessing way. And so one of the most um, predominant images are these avenues vertically, horizontally, coming from the earth, coming from up above. There's a 12-foot petroglyph with the entire body pecked out. And it's quite striking to see up close as an example of the amount of work that went into this, but also looking at this image in relationship to the mountain peaks that I talked about make these strong connections of how and how we become Tewa. There's some interesting images that are pecked around this too. There's a, a horse and rider, uh, maybe an image of a headdress with the cross up on top. And we believe that maybe the cross was pecked after. It's fairly recent. It's not as deeply pecked as the other ones. So that's part of our project is to understand you know, such, as, such a layered history. There's many stories related to these images and how they, how they were pecked and carved and who left them. Up on the other side of Tsinkwaya, this is a view from Posi, Posi Winge, which is the top of Ojo Caliente. There's ancestral trails that cut across this mountain range. And we know there was items that were traded, items that traveled through this entire corridor that document literally the pathways that our ancestors took to get to where they had trade with neighboring communities. One of the areas that we focus on is youth education getting our kids involved in outdoors, getting our kids 
out in the summer to, to sweat, to hike, to climb, to engage. And it's, there's really not kind of a, quote, set curriculum, so to speak. I mean, there's some, some areas that we focus on, but it's, you know, for, for a lot of our kids, it's the first time they've been to these sites. It's the first time that they're able to experience up close, you know, what is a check down? What is a mulch garden? You know, what are the words for, for, for sun, for shadows? Um, you know, kind of a breakdown of vocabulary 101. Uh, language is obviously embedded in everything that we do from an outdoor perspective. It's really not uh, conducive to sitting in a classroom, although that's really important too. Uh, but this is an example of what our kids do, do um, to help document our sites. Um, at the end of the day, they, you know, go down swimming in the, in the river and uh, do all kinds of gathering um, that includes, you know, willows, some of the, some of the cedars, some of the juniper in the area, and just talking about that. And again, it's about our landscape as a textbook. These are pages. These are stories that are right at our tips, and we have access to you. It hasn't always been the way this way where we've had access to particular um, cultural sites. So I should also say that a lot of this is private land. It's BLM, Bureau of Land Management land, and tribal land. And so despite legal ownership as a project, we try to work with each of the landowners to, to provide access um, and to really um, work with them to, to understand what's on site, education, leads to being a better steward. And so our kids really leave with this mantra. We have a strong partnership with uh, local tribal communities. We get students from from uh, Hapo Winge, from Tetsuge, from Oke Winge, Taos, and other areas, bringing their kids up here to, to visit, um, to spend time, and to learn more about the cultural traditions. Some of our summer youth also spend time picking up trash. Uh, as an executive director, I too am a trash picker. <laughs> it's everybody rolls their sleeves up, we set up tables, we set up lunches, we pick trash, we do everything, and so it's all hands on deck. And so you model these behaviors, you model these value systems, and it's amazing. You know, at first, you know, students kind of complain about it and, and whatever, but at, you know, at the end of the, the program, I see them collecting, collecting items uh, bringing their reusable water bottles and all these little actions um, add up, right? You know, they, they're able to share that with their families and their relatives too. There's also many examples of bullet holes that our petroglyphs have been used as targets. As you can see um, right in the middle here. Perhaps one of the most grotesque examples is of a sawed-off fallen avanu that was attempted to be removed um, panel uh, that was dropped down below. So we know the image on the left is the original boulder on top, and about you know 50 feet or so down below is the avanu facing down to the ground, which was not the intent when we think about the vertical relationship of how this image was originally pecked out. And so that's something our project recently uncovered um, and determined that there was, was, was vandalism. And so our students get to see examples of this too and, and think about, you know, what does it mean to, to repair this? Can we put it back? Um, or do we leave it as a, as a tool to teach about vandalism? Our project also engages local Tewa language programs, and if you haven't been to our site, I, I invite you um, to come spend time. But at Okiwinge, I can speak for that as, as my own na nation, is that we have a Tewa language class that actively gets out to cultural sites, to places like um, Tewa Yoge, to Opakeri, which is our, our Tewa name for, for Chaco, and you all have your own words for Chaco. Um, but we, we often um, have these great field trips where we pack our, our lunches and uh, the most 
what I think is one of the most beautiful practices is, is that these are often intergenerational, where there's very young kids who are with their parents, with their grandparents, their aunts and uncles crammed into a bus. And that's something that we need to continue as, as our own tribe. But I hope all of you really spend time to, to go out and visit these sites. There's often a narrative that, you know, why do people leave Chaco? Why did they leave Mesa Verde? Why did they leave these places? Why were they abandoned? They've never been abandoned. They've, they're always alive in our stories and always alive in our memories. And they need to be visited. And so I rely on Ma, Ma, um, Pat, our Tewa teacher, you know, as one of our cultural leaders. And so he's really a lot of, you know, he drives a lot of this curriculum from a classroom perspective. But, you know, we do, you know, cultural um, activities as we go out to these particular sites, too. So they're not forgotten, that they're remembered and they're called upon. We recently built a new playground at Okewinge Community School. It's a beautiful playground. It's, it's this picture, I think, captures that. And, and the background is our community library, which is at the center of the village. And it's named Potsawa Library, which is the Tewa name of my grandmother. And so it was named in her honor because she was a teacher at the, at the school there. Um, but within this playground, the Tewa language group, the teachers, the parents, and the students got together to determine what they wanted to see on the playground. So there are examples of panels, panels that have language, that have Tewa words, that name our mountains, that name our colors, that name the directions, and each of those associations. So kids are not out there just, you know, obviously they're, they're playing and, and doing what they do, but they're reminded. They're reminded that they're part of this larger landscape. And they can look up, look to the east, look to the, to the west, and see examples of these mountain ranges and put a name to Kusei Ping, right? There's a color associated with that. There's also a panel that talks about Tewa values. And just a simple word of bipo wabe takiribo, navi, tsoni, our rules, right? Tsonsi, the rules. What are the guiding values that you should operate as a child at Okewinga Community School? Next to, the, to this uh, playground that I mentioned, we have a school garden. It's a beautiful school garden, and it's lush. There's squash, there's, there's cucumbers, there's a, an amazing abundance. And so, you know, why shouldn't our schools have community gardens? And it's all hands. Parents come in, they, they, they weed, uh, you know, they, they help water. Our kids are able to do that. There's a classroom curriculum around that. And so, you know, it's more than just being within the four doors of a classroom, but the outdoors is your own classroom space. And this models it, and I hope it continues in something that I'm really supportive of here. I put together this compilation of photos. One is this long line of, of deer dancers that I mentioned earlier, but it's in relationship to what we already know as pecked images, as features in the landscape. And I often tell my son, who's, who's an athlete at the Santa Fe Indian School, and have to, think, to kind of speak to what are, what are examples that a 15-year-old can get. And so I told him, imagine a large basketball net that covers the entire state of New Mexico, maybe even the entire globe. But for now, think of it as just basketball net over New Mexico. Within every visible square is a cultural property that is interconnected with other squares. And the spaces in between the net are equally as significant. What is not connected on this landscape 
is part of the story too. And so wherever you go out to play basketball, when you're running, you look up, you may or may not see certain structures and dwellings, artifacts, pottery, but what you don't see is also being present. And so I like to talk about the example of the basketball net for him with the kids, but I was also just you know thinking about you know all our ancestors who've who paved the way for all of us to be here is that if you don't physically see them does not mean they're they're not always present and so that's something to to really think about as our guiding forces. So suffice it to say that the entire Rio Grande corridor is a vast network of trade and exchange that continues to be very much alive. We're essentially the link to our ancestors and the unborn, and we all carry the responsibility of being good stewards, and that language and landscape are very intimately connected, and there's a logical way to think about outdoor education, and I have a breakout session that we can give some kind of practical methods of how we do that and how other communities are doing that. So I look forward to you know, talking more with you in depth on that. My Satya and Matt and my Uncle Herman continue to provide this pathway and to recognize that these objects and these artifacts, again, these are English terms, are just not stored in these, these collections, but they continue to be remembered. Our life experiences are embedded in our stories. We are people of stories. I titled this talk, Hawk Gandhi, as a translation as a bringer of breath. So ha is our breath, what we offer when we receive um, a gift, food, water, whatever the case may be. The breath is what we you know, start our lives with into this world and as we exit this world. But these can also be determined as ha, as songs. And so it's the songs and breath that are often interrelated and connected to you. And kangi, right, the bringing of that too is often refer referenced to, to being a teacher. So the literal translation is the bringer of breath and knowledge within a value system that is situated in this larger homeland. So being teachers, and that's a mantra that we include at Okiyomi Community School is that every cook, every bus driver, every teacher, every principal, they're all educators, and we all can be language learners. And my grandmother, and as a 50-year-old getting into language preservation gives, gives hope for myself as, as a second language acquisition. Um, as I age and get older, um, but I'm still very, still very young, um, but also that my, my son and his friends and their family and my nephews, all of them are watching us too. So I look forward in discussing more at a breakout session and sharing more about my nonprofit and the work that we can interface with other like-minded stakeholders and community um, organizations. So, thank you. For, for listening to me today. Um, I don't want to get, be are we between lunch and, and a break? I hate being that person. But kunta wahan baiki hi champo kunta po kui wasi wa viani.